in, uh, in downstairs, and it is a very going to be, I suspect, a very late night. So at this point, I seek leave to incorporate the second reading speech um, that was made in the other place into Hansard. Is leave granted? Thank you. Thank you. I commend the bill to the House. Thank you. Further speakers? The Honourable Damien Tudor. Thank you, um, uh, Madam uh, Acting President. Um, it is now 10 past 11 at night. This is a very significant piece of legislation and we are starting a debate about this piece of legislation at 10 past 11 at night. There are people who will want to speak on this piece of legislation who may well have gone home, may be too tired to do so, may want to move amendments, uh, but because of the hour of the night, not do so. That, in my respectful submission to the Leader of the Government, is an abuse of democracy. This should not be starting, this bill should not be starting at this hour of night. Um, it is, in many respects, um, uh, uh, something that I think grieves me, that uh, um, people who should be given an opportunity to talk, to speak, are not, uh, not given that opportunity in circumstances where they are fresh, where they've had an opportunity of preparing properly uh, for the speech which they would want to give, and in many respects, it is also an abuse of all the people who may want to watch this debate, to participate in it. I've had more emails about this particular bill than any other bill that has come before this place. And I anticipate that there would be lots of people wanting to know what people have to say about this particular piece of legislation. Uh, and to be starting now, to be starting now, in circumstances where there is no urgency which attaches to this bill. It is not due to start for 12 months. Uh, it is not, the, for, is not uh, uh, the bill is uh, articulated to commence in 12 months' time. Um, uh, why are we here doing this tonight? Why are we not doing this potentially tomorrow? Why are we not doing it uh, potentially on the first sitting day uh, that uh, is available in May. And I'll tell you why. Because the government wants this piece of legislation out of the road. The government does not want continuing public exposure of this piece of, uh, of legislation. They do not want uh, uh, people, I suppose, to have an input and put potential pressure on uh, members of the government in relation to uh, different views in relation to uh, the provisions of this legislation. Now, uh, I can only say that uh, um, uh, 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 Mark Latham was right earlier today when he says that this was, is part of the manner in which the government does its business in relation to difficult issues. First of all, the government uh, rejected an opportunity of having, a, having an inquiry. Uh, uh, an inquiry which could have been done in circumstances where we could have uh, done the inquiry over the break, first week back uh, in May, the report, report could have been available and the debate could have continued. But no, no, uh, this is a government which says that in relation to this sort of controversial legislation, get it out of the road, we will not brook amendments, we will not brook any further debate in relation to it. We are perfect. We are perfect and we will not, in fact, uh, even consider amendments, even if they are reasonable amendments, we won't consider them. And we've got the perfect Attorney General over here. He's got perfect ways of think thinking, thinking about legislation. No, 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 that's... You know, uh, uh, the, that I, I'm, I'm the first one to, uh, to admit, you know, this, this bloke has you know, got to be some sort of uh, megastar because he is the only minister I have ever known who claims the title of the perfect, the perfect attorney who, who brings in uh, legislation incapable of any amendment, incapable of amendment and incapable of having amendments considered properly by the legislature of this place. Incapable. Even if they are really simple, even if they are in many respects reasonable, this bloke will not consider those amendments because it doesn't fit with his agenda. Now, 
I have to say uh, that uh, that is the height of arrogance. The height of arrogance. Mr Perfect is in fact Mr Arrogant. So turning to this bill, and I... Uh, it's probably... Uh, I've got to say something relevant. Um, uh, Madam Acting President, um, I happen to agree with what of um, uh, a lot of what the leader of the government said, because in fact I agree with her that uh, New South Wales is a multicultural society uh, with a wide range of perspectives on all sorts of matters, including the nature and purpose of human sexuality and the meaning of gender identity. Views on the two matters addressed in this bill, sexual orientation and gender identity, vary significantly. Many religious organisations and individual believers hold a firm view, often based on a traditional reading of religious texts, that the meaning of human sexuality is innately tied to human reproduction and the biological complementarity of men and women. Based on this view, some religious bodies teach and individual believers accept that sexual acts should only take place between two people of the opposite sex who are married to each other. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, there are views of sexuality are those who hold that any sexual acts between two or more people who are each above the age of legal consent are valid and indeed should be celebrated. Similarly, there is a wide range of views on the issue of gender identity. Several of the women's groups, including some feminist groups, are insistent, based on science they say, that sex is a biological reality and that the notion of an individual having a gender identity that differs from the individual's biological sex is fanciful and has no, no grounds in reality. In the view of these groups, pandering to these fanciful claims about an invisible gender identity poses real risks to hard-won women's rights, including the right to safe women-only spaces. Others believe that not just that believe not just that an individual's gender identity may differ from their biological sex as assigned at birth, but there are multiple possible gender identities, and that a person may change their self-declared gender identity as frequently as they feel inclined to do so, and that anyone who objects or even fails to affirm each of these self-declared gender identities is committing a breach of human rights that should be punished. How do we approach legislating for the whole community with, with such widely differing views? Mutual respect, an open acknowledgement of different views and a genuine search for common ground are the appropriate approaches to the challenge of differing and often conflicting perspectives on what is truly good for the human person and for the community. Prior to the March 2023 election, the member for Epping, the then Premier, was the first leader to commit to legislating a ban on damaging gay conversion practices. He referred specifically to practices such as electroconvulsive therapy and food deprivation. The main offence provision in this bill, the bill before us tonight, appropriately includes an objective threshold of causing mental or physical harm to an individual that endangers the individual's life or is substantial. There is a broad common consensus that such practices are wrong and should not be permitted. Hopefully there will never be, uh, never be a need for a prosecution for this offence as the passage of this provision into law should cement the existing consensus that such practices are simply wrong. Yeah. However, beside the creation of a specific offence, the bill would also introduce a very complex and potentially intrusive regime of civil complaints based on an unqualified provision that an entity contravenes this act if the entity provides or delivers a conversion practice. The complex definition of conversion practice in section three takes nearly a full page of the bill. It includes various exclusions. 
Understanding exactly what is and is not a conversion practice should be possible for all interested parties, including religious groups, feminist groups, families and health practitioners. Good law depends upon transparent law, people being, un being able to understand it readily. If this understanding is not easy to, to attain, there may be significant consequences. People acting in good faith may find themselves accused of engaging in a banned conversion practice. Others, fearful of breaking the law they don't understand, may fail to provide needed helpful treatment, care or advice to a person who requests it. Specific concerns about the bill, as it is before us tonight, have been raised, as I said before, by feminist groups, religious groups, health practitioners, and many individuals, including parents, with very genuine concerns about the potential intrusion into family life. The opposition will be supporting the bill at the second reading because it introduces an offence which will penalise practices about which there is broad consensus in the community and they should, and they should be prohibited. And we promised this during the election campaign that we would ban it. However, we will be seeking to move a number of amendments during the committee stage to address at least some of these concerns that have been raised with us. We urge all members to consider each of these amendments on their merits and not just follow blindly the dictate of their party. If the government had held a genuine, open consultation with all stakeholders before introducing this bill, then these amendments may not have been necessary. Secret consultations only with a favoured few stakeholders is not how an open democracy should work. Excluding those with challenging opinions is unhelpful. Religious groups may learn to their regret that being invited to participate with the Minns Labor government in a secret dialogue is not the best way to achieve the best outcome for their members. The brash way in which the government has treated their participation as a de facto endorsement of the bill introduced should be a reminder that the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Religious groups and individual believers remain concerned that encouragements to live chastely outside of marriage may fall under the ban of conversion practices and that in some circumstances, prayers and sermons, as the, uh, and sermons may become unlawful. Health professionals, including those assisting children with gender identity issues, remain unclear as to what approaches to treatment they can provide without risking the wrath of the anti-discrimination president. Can genuine help with coping skills be offered to a person at their request or only if there is certainty that the anti-discrimination president will not subsequently find that it was not directed to meeting the person's real needs. Will the anti-discrimination president be knocking on the door of a family home to pursue complaints against parents for going beyond a bland discussion and setting rules and behaviour standards for a child living under their roof? I will address these concerns more precisely during the committee stage of this bill when I move a number of amendments, most of which have been requested by the very faith leaders that were, the, were, that were consulting with the government in relation uh, to this bill. And I just want to say this to uh, the various faith leaders um, who are now being embraced and uh, given the warm um, uh, endorsement of, uh, of this bill or giving the, the warm endorsement to this bill. Um, in many respects, I understand uh, that you wanted to, to, to that I wanted them, they wanted to achieve an outcome uh, which they thought was the best outcome for the community which they represent. But it, there is a point, of course, where if you don't achieve what you think is in the best interests of your community, and in circumstances where they have written to, where they have written to numerous members of this place, requesting additional, additional 
uh, amendments uh, to this legislation. There is a point where they need to be actually able to stand up and say that the bill is not one which they can continue to support. They are silent in relation to their participation in relation to that. Uh, they are silent in saying to members whether they should support or not support the bill if the amendments which we will uh, move tonight are not carried. And I have to say to those faith leaders, I think that is uh, in fact moral cowardice uh, because if you request various amendments to be made and you think that they are so important in relation to this legislation, when you should have the courage to be able to say to those people who you're writing to, whether you in those circumstances would continue to support the bill or whether you would not support the bill. Now, uh, the failure to be able to do so, I think, represents for each and every one of them uh, a real, uh, um, uh, in, my, in my most respectful submission to each of them, a real betrayal of the communities which they represent. Um, if you really believe it and you really want these amendments passed, then you should have had the courage to say so. I will reserve my further comments in relation to uh, the bill uh, to the committee stage and the amendments which I will, uh, will be making. I would in, as I indicated earlier, the government will be supporting uh, the bill uh, on the second reading stage, subject, sorry, sorry the opposition, sorry, big pun. The opposition will be supporting the bill uh, at the uh, second reading stage, subject to, of course, uh, moving various amendments during the committee stage of this bill. Dr. Amanda Khan. As Green spokesperson for LGBTQIA+, I indicate that the Greens will be supporting the Conversion Practices Ban Bill 2024, as well as seeking amendment to strengthen the bill. Conversion practices are founded on the dangerous falsehood that LGBTQA plus people are broken or disordered, and that we can and should be treated or corrected. There is no medical basis for conversion practices. Sexuality and gender identity are not choices that can be changed. Conversion practices shouldn't be referred to as therapy because there is nothing therapeutic about them. Bans of these practices have been slowly rolling out since the UN called for a global ban in 2020. Victoria, the Australian Capital Territory and New Zealand have outlawed conversion practices. We are here debating this bill today because of the tireless work of victim survivors who have advocated for many years to ensure that no one will have to go through what they have endured. There is a misconception by some that conversion practices are a thing of the past, but conversion practices are indeed taking place in New South Wales in 2024. Peer-reviewed Australian research undertaken in 2019 has shown that 4% of LGBTQA plus Australians aged between 14 and 21 years have experienced conversion practices. This is a conservative estimate, and with the inclusion of informal practices, this could be as high as 10%. In 2022, when Victoria was drafting its legislation to ban conversion practices, at least 10 organisations in Australia and New Zealand were found to be publicly advertising these practices. Previous generations endured conversion practices with overtly cruel interventions like electroshock therapy. But modern conversion practices look duplicitously like care. They look like psychology or counselling sessions, exorcism, people being prayed over and celibacy groups. As many survivors of conversion practices have shared, this so-called therapy doesn't change anyone's sexuality or gender identity. What it has done is wear down people's self-esteem, made them believe that there's something wrong with them, that they're possessed by demons, that they are failures for not having been able to change. Conversion practices have made people hate themselves and believe that they are better off dead than being same-sex attracted or gender diverse. The Australian Medical Association have stated, quote, there is strong agreement among the medical profession in Australia that conversion practices have no medical benefit or scientific basis, and that there is evidence of significant harms resulting from such practices, end quote. Of course, there is no, more, no voice more important in this debate than the voices of victim survivors of conversion practices. I thank every survivor who bravely shared their story with members of parliament and the broader community and note the testimonies that were shared during the debate in the Legislative Assembly yesterday of Eamon, Samuel, Anthony and Dawn, um, and the testimonies that were shared by the Leader of the Government in this debate. I'd like to share some of the testimony of Jeremy Smith. 
He says, quote, I grew up in the conservative Catholic sect Opus Dei. The school I went to was an environment rife with homophobia. We were taught that sexually active gay people were intrinsically morally evil and destined for hell. The school's motto, the truth will set you free, was cruelly ironic given that myself and others were told to not only hide and repress our true sexuality, but to also change it. After I came out to my mum as gay at 16, she told my school tutor without my knowledge. I remember a conversation with my tutor in which he said I must never act on my attraction to other boys. My parents took me to a child psychiatrist who offered me therapy to suppress my attraction to boys. I declined this therapy. Then my parents took me to see a Jesuit Catholic priest. I remember being taken to this priest against my will, crying in the car on the way to and during the session. This therapy would involve prayer if I had impure thoughts, methods to force myself to not act on my sexuality and conversations about the implications of being gay on my eternal soul. I remember nights trying to hold my breath to make any sexual arousal go away. I remember nights where I would cry myself to sleep thinking that I was sinful and destined to be damned to hell. After a few sessions, I remember being in the car with my mum on the way home, breaking down crying, saying I was growing to hate a part of myself. Although my brush with conversion practices was only fleeting, it has left lasting scars. Conversion practices of all kinds encourage dark thought patterns and self-loathing, and the protections must extend to gender-diverse people given the high rates of suicide for young trans people. I have since received real therapy in my 20s that helped me overcome the trauma of the conversion therapy I experienced. You wouldn't send your child to places that promote eating disorders or self-harm, and yet that is exactly what conversion practices are, a form of self-harm. These practices must be outlawed to save lives. Another person with a valuable story is Ace Leeson. Quote, as a teenager, when I realised I was attracted to women, I did what was expected, and that was go to church leaders. I told my youth pastor, and she said to me, God has a plan for your life. And if you choose the wrong path, if you date women, you will only find death and destruction. So I tried to follow God's path for the next 15 years. God's path was prayer camps where demons were cast out of me, confession meetings with my church leaders, studying ex-gay ministry materials and even installing spyware on my computer. I was also encouraged to get married, which didn't work out. But in having my kid, I had the opportunity to meet people outside of the church, including a happy lesbian couple who had kids. That was mind-blowing for me to see that being queer didn't have to mean destruction, but that I could be myself and be happy, end quote. Thank you to Jeremy and Ace and other survivors who have retold their personal trauma over and over again, who have helped the parliament and the community to understand the profound negative impact of conversion practices. I also acknowledge the many survivors listening tonight who are not able to relive or share their trauma in this way. The bill defines a conversion practice as a practice, treatment or sustained effort that is directed to an individual on the basis of the individual's sexual orientation or gender identity and directed to changing or suppressing the individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. The inclusion of gender identity is welcome, recognising the unique vulnerability of trans and gender, di gender diverse people who face some of the worst discrimination in our communities. Importantly, it includes suppression as a form of conversion practice, which is critical when this is the form of many modern conversion practices and can be just as harmful. The definition proposed in the bill includes a specific exception for an expression that a belief or principle ought to be followed or applied. The Greens believe that the definition and this exclusion means that some harmful practices will not be captured by the bill and will be moving an amendment to address this. The bill sets out both a criminal offence and civil complaint scheme to address conversion practices. A criminal penalty is appropriate where there is evidence of substantial mental or physical harm, noting this can be cumulative. The most important change that this bill will drive in New South Wales is not that significant numbers of people will be criminalised, it's that a very clear deterrent is set that can prevent harm from taking place. This is about protecting LGBTQA plus people and particularly LGBTQA plus people of faith who are most likely to be subjected to these practices. I understand that the civil complaint scheme has been modelled on the provisions of the Anti-Discrimination Act. This complaints mechanism requires the identification of a named and consenting complainant. <coughs> However, survivors can take years, if ever, before being well enough to reach out for help to make a complaint, let alone make a complaint themselves. Many never realise that they're survivors. The Greens will also be moving an amendment to improve the ability of third parties to report conversion practices. It is a great indignity to survivors, their supporters and LGBTQIA plus people watching with bated breath for the government to have moved this important legislation in the manner that they have. 
This Labor government took a year to introduce this legislation and this bill was scheduled last on today's agenda. I acknowledge those who've been here for many hours for this debate to start at 11 o'clock at night. I'm hopeful that the bill passes tonight. This is an important and overdue change that will save lives. But what's next for LGBTQIA plus people to be able to participate fully in community life, free from discrimination in New South Wales? New South Wales will still have the worst laws in the country for LGBTQIA plus people, with people who are bisexual like me, intersex or non-binary, not protected by the Anti-Discrimination Act. New South Wales still requires people to undergo violating and medically unnecessary genital surgery to be able to change their gender on official documents. We are still performing unnecessary surgery on kids born with variation of sex characteristics that cause long-term harm. The recommendations of the Special Commission of Inquiry into LGBTIQ hate crimes haven't been implemented, and we don't have a minister or a commissioner to drive and coordinate the reform that we need. Tonight, hopefully, we take one big step forward. Let's relegate conversion practices to the dustbin of history where they belong. I commend the bill to the House. Thank you. Before I call the Honourable Stephen Lawrence, I want to acknowledge that with us here tonight, either in the galleries or I believe also watching in the quarry room, we have Chris Sabs, Anna Brown, Gassane Kasse, Tammy Vardone, Teddy Cook, Sam Johnson, Danielle Jung, Noreen Shah, Tiffany Jones, Anna Van Brown, Emily McMullen, oh, sorry, Emily Mulligan, plus LGBTQI community and supporters and the members for Sydney and Newtown and, of course, the Attorney-General. They're most welcome. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Conversion Practices Ban Bill 2024. We have all received a deluge of emails and letters about this bill and related issues. This strength of feeling in the community is mirrored here where I know there are strong and conflicting views. Uh, the bill represents a valiant attempt to balance the need to repudiate and prevent harmful conversion practices on one hand and the need on the other to, one, protect freedom of religion, two, uphold the sanctity of communications and relationships within the family, three, allow the medical profession to treat complex health issues with informed care and good judgment. I'm aware of the trauma associated with the historical and ongoing use of conversion practices. And I do think that we need to be mindful of that in our contributions, while of course we must also speak freely. Um, I spoke this week to a friend of mine who was subjected to conversion therapy as a teenager back in 1967. He is a delightful human being, funny, intelligent, and now even able to see the dark humour in his own experiences. I'll read some of the notes uh, from my conversation with Michael Tobin. Quote, I object to the term conversion. What I experienced was all about aversion. They never actually offered the conversion part. It seemed to be aimed at making one asexual. When I was growing up, being gay didn't exist. When I decided I was gay, by that I mean attracted to males, I didn't want it. I wanted to be normal. As you get older, you discover that normal itself has 50 shades of grey. I went to Lifeline first. I was 19. It was 1967. They referred me to Neil McConaughey. At that time, Australia's foremost expert in treating homosexuality. He took me at my word and decided I needed to be treated. I was at Prince Henry Hospital for a week in the psychiatric ward. That was deeply disturbing. It was full of acute, acutely mentally ill people. I didn't consider myself to be crazy. The week converted me to not wanting to convert. Stage one of the aversion therapy involved showing me pictures of naked boys and men and females, early, teen, early teens onwards. My penis was put in a tube, and if you became sufficiently erect, you got electrocuted. It wasn't painful at first, but an obvious electric shock. The whole process was so embarrassing. I come from a, from a family, a typical Australian family, where nudity was off limits, 
and even discussion of matters sexual was a complete no-go area. Stage two was nausea producing drugs. I opted out of that. After a week of being hospitalised and treated, I can say I became averse to aversion therapy. I remember consciously saying to myself I would rather be gay than asexual. A year later, I ran off and joined the theatre. Within 18 months, I had my first sexual experience and it was so overwhelming, I thought, wow, was I really trying to get away from this? From my experience, I would say you cannot change someone's sexuality. Neil McConaughey's daughter later put on the record that he himself was in fact same-sex attracted. I note that he later had an epiphany and became an expert proponent of sexuality in fact being unchangeable. Now, end quote. That is a story about being subjected to conversion practices at a leading public hospital in this state in 1967. The past is indeed another country. Even more extreme forms of conversion and aversion therapy have been practised in different places, including castration and the deliberate infliction of brain injury. I read that aversion therapies, like the one Michael experienced, had their roots in practices developed in Czechoslovakia and different variations were carried out over a period of about 60 years in certain parts of the world. I read that they were rejected fairly early in the Eastern Bloc, with some early proponents in fact becoming advocates for decriminalisation of homosexuality, which occurred in Czechoslovakia far earlier than here. However, these practices were picked up in Commonwealth countries like Australia and systematically trialled for many years. Their eventual abandonment is dated to around 1973, when psychiatric bodies in several countries began to remove homosexual desire from their catalogues of mental disorders, of which the DSM was one example, or is one example. These systematic medicalised conversion practices are not, of course, the only types of conversion practices. Other types, which are still practised today, are more informal and sometimes difficult to characterise and whose banning potentially raises issues of religious freedom, including counselling, prayer-based sessions and the like. I quote from Amnesty International, quote, these practices are often carried out in the context of pastoral care, prayer ministry, accountability groups or in therapeutic context, such as counsellors or life coaches. Uh, because of this, they can be often difficult to spot and rationalise by religious groups as providing care for unwanted same-sex desire, gender expression, slash gender expression. However, conversion practices can be identified by their common beliefs in conversion ideology, end quote. I read that these modern conversion practices became more common as formal medical conversion practices were abandoned and have been most common in Protestant Christian church denominations, but that similar practices have also been carried out in other Christian and non-Christian faith groups. Australian studies indicate that people in Australia continue to, be, continue to be exposed to conversion practices. A 2019 study of 6,412 LGBTQA plus Australians under 25 found that 4%, 249, attended counselling, group work, interventions or programs aimed at changing or suppressing sexuality or gender identity. A qualitative study undertaken from 2016 of 42 Australian victim survivors found that one third experienced conversion practices through formal therapy with a, with a registered psychologist or counsellor and every participant had experienced spiritual conversion practices. Personally, I speak on this bill remembering well the shame of being a gay kid that can drive consent to such procedures. I recall in the 1980s as a child, fervently wishing not to be gay and praying to God that I might be changed. I remember that belief that there was something wrong with me and hoping it might just go away. But you come to know over time in your heart that it's just you, it's permanent and it can't be fixed. Such shame is produced by a culture that can lead to family and others to in fact compel subjection to such procedures. An important thing about this bill is the message it sends to sexually and gender diverse kids. You are normal, you're absolutely fine as you are, you don't need to be fixed. And I can say to such kids as a gay person that I wouldn't change a thing about my very fortunate and privileged life. While it wasn't true as a child, 
I can say now in all honesty, I wouldn't want to have been born straight because I wouldn't have the wonderful life and partner that I have. And I'm not sure if I'd have the two dogs or not. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I acknowledge that interjection. Section three of the bill is a cornerstone of the proposed scheme and defines a conversion practice as a practice, treatment or sustained effort that is directed to an individual on the basis of the individual's sexual orientation or gender identity and directed to changing or suppressing the individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. Section five then creates a criminal offence if a person provides or delivers a conversion practice to an individual with the intention of changing or suppressing the individual's sexual orientation or gender identity, and that causes mental or physical harm to the individual that endangers the individual's life or is substantial. Um, I do want to discuss some of the concerns that have been raised with members by the community. One is what is said to be an inappropriate conflation of sexual orientation and gender identity as both being an immutable characteristic of a person and the consequences that might flow from such conflation. The question of immutability is relevant to anti-discrimination law and is a feature of American constitutional law with its concern about equal treatment. In Grimm and Gloucester County School Board, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals considered a transgender student's right to use a school bathroom that corresponded to his gender. The court had to decide whether transgender status was, a was quote, a class that may be defined as a discrete group by obvious immutable or distinguishing characteristics. The court held, quote, gender identity is formulated for most people at a very early age, and as our medical amici explain, being transgender is not a choice. Rather, it is as natural and immutable as being cisgender. The court did, however, limit this to, quote, the rights of transgender students who consistently, persistently and insistently express a binary gender and stress Grimm's immutable gender in the opinion, stating, for example, Grimm always knew that he was a boy and, quote, would opt to wear boys' clothing. Later, the court wrote that he did not question his gender identity at all. He knew he was a boy. It is commonly said and probably understood that sexual orientation is a generally immutable characteristic of a person, meaning an unchanging and fixed quality of a person. That said, I would not suggest that everyone is one way or the other or that nobody has changes in their sexuality over the course of their life. Uh, gender identity, on the, on the other hand, is said to often lack that quality of, immutable, of immutability. It may be immutable as demonstrated in the United States case I just referred to, but sometimes, perhaps often, it is said not to be so. It can shift over time. The research I have assessed seems to support these contentions, that gender identity can be less immutable, that it can and often does change over the course of a person's life. There is a wealth of evidence. I note the Westmead Hospital has published statistics on the rate of desistance for young people diagnosed with gender dysphoria and assessed it at 9% and at 22% overall among those presenting with gender confusion and distress. This would seem to show that many young people provided with the appropriate medical care who identify as trans may, may not do so later in life. It obviously doesn't say anything about young people who identify as trans and don't seek gender affirming treatment and their rate of desistance, one would assume that it may be higher. This in no way dismisses or undermines their right to identify as male or female and of, of course, to be treated with respect. In any event, it must be stressed for many people their gender identity is fixed and immutable, just as described by that American court in Grimm. As part of the queer community, I've known many such people. I'm talking about trans people, whether or not they seek medical interventions and ultimately gender reassignment surgery, who know exactly what they are and always have, and it is not a gender consistent with their biological sex. I have, on the other hand, also known once trans people who no longer identify as such. The phenomena of desistance is a relevant thing to note in this debate because a large part of the community concern around trans issues at the moment is focused on the question of medical treatment of trans youth, youth, in particular the use of puberty blockers and surgical interventions that in effect seek to align gender identity with sex. A concern being expressed is that trans youth will avail themselves of life-changing medical interventions in circumstances where they will later regret it and or where they would later, without the treatment, have assumed a gender identity consistent with their biological sex i.e. that permanent medical treatment will be given 
at a time when a person being a child is less equipped to make decisions with long-term implications for a situation that is not in fact permanent but the effects of the treatment will be. Another concern is that there is said to be a lack of evidence that such early interventions, commonly referred to as the Dutch protocol, actually minimise the distressing symptoms of gender dysphoria in young people. The research on this seems to be evolving and conflicting. I do not recite these concerns to adopt them, and indeed the complexity of the medical and research issues make it difficult for me to form a certain view on some of these concerns. I raise them because the broad, these broader concerns feed into consideration of the bill in a few different ways. Firstly, there is a concern, again, that has been expressed by community members, that the legislation itself adopts this premise of immutability in respect of both sexual orientation and gender identity. That it, this is said to come, firstly, from the twinning of the concept of gender identity with the concept of sexual orientation, but also from the provisions in subsection 3 of section 3 in terms of what is excluded from the meaning of conversion practice. The concern, as I understand it, is that these exceptions and legislative examples seem to be premised on the idea that a person has one fixed gender identity that should not be challenged, even if a person can be assisted to explore it under the legislation. A part of the concerns being expressed is particularly that same-sex attracted youth might identify as trans and ultimately undergo medical, medical interventions, when in fact, if given time, they, they might ultimately desist and identify as gay or something else. There is, of course, a close connection between gender and sexuality in a society that enforces both in a close and related way. The concern is being expressed particularly strongly in respect of young same-sex attracted people, perhaps with other conditions, that might make a diagnosis of gender dysphoria a more complex exercise, and which it is said might require greater exploration and may be challenged by medical professionals to determine the most effective form of care. A second concern being expressed is that this alleged legislative premise of immutability or the fact of potential exposure to wrongful criminal prosecution might impact the way in which the medical profession administers treatment for gender distress, confusion and dysphoria, i.e. that doctors, psychologists and psychiatrists might feel compelled to affirm a state of gender identity and prescribe medical treatment and proceed on the basis gender identity is immutable and once articulated must be affirmed, even if the professional, for example, is concerned the etymology of the articulation of the gender identity is something else, or, or uh, on the other hand, be less likely to treat these conditions at all, as they will perceive a risk of complaints in circumstances where the line between legitimate exploration of identity might be fine and subjective. On the second concern, I think it is important to consider not just what a piece of legislation might say and what we think it in fact means, but also a range of uncertainties, not just in legal meaning, but how it will actually operate, what fields of operation it will have. I say that because our laws are not, uh, our laws are not just normative propositions with a fixed meaning and effect. They operate in many and varied ways in the way they are both understood and enforced. It should be acknowledged, though, that these concerns and the debate they are part of does not occur in a vacuum. Many of these concerns, though not all, are being expressed by churches and faith-based organisations. Many are influenced, and proudly so, by theological scripture-based principles and natural law philosophical precepts. I don't say that to dismiss their concerns, but it must be acknowledged that many voices in the debate do have that perspective. But not all the voices can be characterised in that way. There are medical professionals and professional groups also raising concerns who don't seem motivated in that way. There does seem to be a rapid increase in reports and diagnoses of gender dysphoria, and this, on my view, seems to be a new and evolving area of medical specialty. As I said, I find some of these issues and concerns hard to form a settled view on. However, I'm comfortable supporting the bill because of the clear exception to liability in section three, subsection three, for a health service or treatment provider by a registered health practitioner that they have assessed as clinically appropriate in their reasonable professional judgment and which complies with all relevant legal, professional and ethical requirements. I note also the examples in section three, subsection three, of what is not a conversion practice, including genuinely assisting an individual who is exploring the individual's sexual orientation or gender identity or considering or undergoing a gender transition. Two, genuinely assisting an individual who is receiving care and treatment related to the individual's gender identity. And three, genuinely advising an individual about the potential impacts of gender-affirming medical treatment. In my view, the exception in the examples make it clear if clarity was needed. 
that a medical professional is not required to always affirm a professed gender identity, let alone required to prescribe significant medical treatment if not satisfied it is needed and in the best interest of the patient. While the risk of the section stifling a divergence of views in the medical profession or causing some professionals not to practice in the area because of a perceived risk of prosecution is concerning on its face. I understand the legislative examples have helped address concern and I trust the consultation has occurred in a proper way. We ultimately need to trust our institutions of justice in how these laws are enforced, just like we, are, we, need, we need ultimately to trust our professions in how they will operate in the context of these laws. These issues fundamentally are between patients and doctors. That is the only way these complex issues can be worked out in the best possible way. And there is a, there is a real risk in not legislating. The evidence before us is that harmful conversion practices continue to occur. That is unacceptable. On that basis, I hope this bill is passed and that it works well, that it puts an end to conversion practices and that it sends a powerful message to our diverse communities that they are indeed normal, accepted and respected. I commend the bill to the House. The Honourable Natasha McLaren-Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Before the state election in March 2023, the former pre Premier, the Honourable Dominic Perrottet MP, made history as the first leader to pre pledge the passing of a law prohibiting damaging gay conversion therapy should he be re-elected as Premier. The then Premier Perrottet articulated his determination to eradicate harmful gay conversion practices, citing method methods such as electroconvulsive therapy and food deprivation as examples. He pledged to ensure a fair and equitable approach in crafting any legislation on the issue. During the election, the Liberal Party's stance was centred on striking a delicate balance between prohibiting detrimental practices and safeguarding essential freedoms. I've received numerous correspondence and met with various individuals and organisations who feel very strongly about this bill, and I want to thank them for taking the time to explain their views and concerns. It is unfortunate the government has refused to give other organisations and the public the opportunity to thoroughly consider the bill in detail, rather than rushing it through at the 11th hour. Frankly, it's undemocratic and leaves little time for members to review the legislation or consult more broadly with the community to hear their concerns or voice their support for it. If the coalition initially led the charge on this issue, it seems that they've been excluded from the legislative development process by the Minns Labor government. From the government standpoint, the prospect of bipartisanship, both on this matter and others, dissipates following the state election. The approach of conducting consultations on the bill behind closed doors with select stakeholders has been unfortunate. This opaque method of underscores a growing pattern of lack of transparency from the men's government across various areas. Despite questions being asked of Labor, we still don't know which groups were consulted and I understand there are many that were asked to, be, asked to be included but were not. Some stakeholders, notably absent from consultation process, included LGB Alliance Australia, Christian, Australia, Christian Schools Australia, Australian Association of Women's Schools, Australian Feminists for Women's Rights and several more. Correspondence received from Rachel Wong from the Women's Forum Australia states, and I quote, we received no feedback at all from our submission and we were not invited to participate in any of the closed roundtable meetings that were conducted, despite our clear community interests regarding the proposed bill. Unlike what has been the case for a very small select group of stakeholders, neither were we provided with any draft bill for review. We understand that there are other group, women's groups, as well as children, parents and LGB alliance groups who similarly found themselves shut out of the consultation on the bill. Labor's decision to carry out secretive closed-door consultation highlights that more than half of the elected representatives in this parliament, including all members of the coalition, were left out of these discussions and were never provided with a draft version of the bill at any point. Such an approach is extraordinary, particularly for a minority government. It means that the Liberals and National only had sight of the bill less than a week ago when the Attorney-General tabled it and commenced his second reading speech in the Legislative Assembly on the afternoon of Wednesday the 13th of March. This timeline effectively gave the opposition less than four clear business days, including only two parliamentary sitting days where other legislation were being discussed to engage on the bill. This time frame 
encompasses discussing the bill among colleagues, gathering community feedback and formulating a position to present in this chamber today. The government is intent to expedite the passage of this legislation through both houses of parliament this week. Many will be enacted about a week after it's first been made public to the opposition and to the general public. This rush timeline is undeniably unreasonable and undemocratic and frankly arrogant. It has left insufficient time for the community to review the legislation, consult with their local members of parliament as expected in a representative democracy. It leaves insufficient time for members to gather feedback from communities they represent. It's not just residents of coalition electorates who have been grudgingly disappointed with this situation. Members of the community residing in Labor's electorates should, should also be gutted that their representatives are part of a government that has imposed an unreasonable time frame, preventing proper public consultation. Public consultation serves as a vital avenue for gauging community perspective on legislation. Whether it's regarding concerns that are being proposed, measures may not go far enough, or that certain rights may not be adequately protected. Earlier this week, on Tuesday, the Legislative Council Selection of Bills Committee made a decision to refer the bill for an inquiry, a move supported by the opposition. In this context, such an inquiry would have afforded greater opportunity for thorough consideration, public engagement and scrutiny of potential amendments to the bill. However, the Premier decided or directed his colleagues in the Labor Party in this chamber to align with the Greens and thought any opportunity for an upper house inquiry. This decision underscores the Minns government's determination to sidestep proper scrutiny of its legislation, to sidestep, sidestep transparency and to sidestep accountability. Members of diverse religious communities, including Christian, Muslims, Hindus and others, representing our culturally rich society, are trying to understand how this legislation may affect their freedom of faith. They seek assurances that their cultural values, religious teachings and practices will be respected and that adherence to their beliefs will not be subject them to unintended legal consequences under the bill. Furthermore, many non-religious groups and community members are also trying to understand how their families and freedoms might be impacted by this bill. For example, the definition of the term suppression contained in the bill is undefined, which could concern most people, particularly parents who may wish and should be able to discuss any topic with their child without interference by government. These dynamics highlight the complexity of the issues at hand and the need for thorough examination and consideration to ensure that the legislation adequately addresses the diverse range of perspectives and concerns within the community. The Attorney General's stance of rejecting amendments suggests a belief in a bill's perfection, disregarding the possibility of improving improvements through alternative perspectives on its wording and construction. However, legislation is not infallible and can benefit from input to refine its effectiveness. Given the significant impact of this bill on people's lives, it's imperative to ensure it is robust as possible. Drafting legislation presents significant challenges, particularly in carefully delineating the definitions of conversion and suppression practices. It must address the delicate balance of safeguarding religious speech and teaching while ensuring that sincere, albeit imperfect, Conversation between parents and children rooted in love and good intentions are not subject to prosecution. It's strikingly ironic that despite the government's desire for initiating number of reviews and inquiries, some of which endure for a year or more, this particular legislative process will conclude within just one week. This is despite the bill having been delayed commencement of a 12 month after its ascent. This rapid timeline appears to prioritise political manoeuvring over genuine consideration for the people of New South Wales, or the fundamental purpose for which this parliament was established, to represent the interests of the public and hold the government accountable. Labor have already commenced a review of the Anti-Discrimination Act, a process expected to span well over a year and remain active for several months. Notably, certain aspects of the Conversion Practices Bill are entwined within provisions of this law, yet the former is slated in the passage well advanced, not within a mere week. This discrepancy raises concerns of hypocrisy and unwarranted haste. While the government appears to have consulted with segments of the community that are highly supportive, it has sidestepped engagement with other groups and evaded dealing with challenging questions surrounding the bill. Organisations such as the Women Forum Australia and the Australian Feminists for Women's Rights have strongly advocated for the removal of gender from the bill, a request that that merits consideration. 
Unfortunately, due to time constraints preventing me from delving into the details uh, and substantive concerns that have been shared with me and others regarding the bill. However, I note my colleague has indicated we'll be moving a number of amendments in the committee stage, and these amendments are crucial. I urge the Labor Party to remain open-minded with their approach to port towards the amendments that are being put forward by the opposition. It is imperative that we strike a balance needed that will serve our community as a whole. Honourable Mark Benassiak. Thank you, Mr. Assistant President. Today uh, we are faced with debating the government's election commitment dilemma. And it is a dilemma because they promised people from the LGBTQI plus community that they would do something for them and then promised the faith groups that what they delivered for that community wouldn't infringe on the religious and faith-based practices and parental rights. The reality is that the Labor Party has promised the impossible, which is freely admitted by many of the groups that the Attorney General's office consulted. The proposed Conversion Practices Ban Bill 2024 legislation has actually been introduced with no demonstrable need attached. No one has been able to articulate with any clarity or point to current statistics uh, that indicate that present day practices are causing harm or substantial harm. Sure, there has been historical processes and practices in the past that upon a reflection, everyone would agree were not great and are not acceptable. But the question needs to be asked, without a demonstrable need or current problem to solve, is this legislation necessary? Have, is the legislation necessary, particularly when we clearly haven't got the balance right between these two groups? Let us be clear, this legislation seeks to regulate deeply personal matters that should perhaps remain within the domain of individual choice and autonomy. Despite the AG's attempts to insert provisions that seek to protect religious beliefs and teachings, these attempts seem to be, uh, need to be clearer, leading to misinterpretation and confusion. The Attorney General has spoken about his engagement with faith groups, but unfortunately the finished product demonstrates that either the Attorney General failed to fully comprehend the tenets of religious beliefs, faith-based practices and teachings put to him in these consultation sessions, or he has understood them but refused to incorporate them into the bill fully. In his second read speech, the AG states, and I quote, the bill does not impact a person's ability of their own consent to seek counsel or guidance from within their faith. Counsel and guidance can still be given provided they are not directed to change or suppress. Yet suppression or nor conversion practice, practices are clearly defined. The bill premises that the range of conversion practices can't actually be defined by the Attorney General specifically in terms of specific acts. Additionally, there is commentary in that conversion practices are based on a misconception or presumption that LGBTQI plus people are broken and need fixing. Once again, no one can point to specific presently committed acts that will be covered under the definition of conversion practices that, to, that seek to do what is suggested as treating people as broken. Because of the vague concepts described in the bill, we have a bill that will limit free expression of speech between uh, parents, family and their children, faith-based practices and equally more important, formal, informal counselling and actually will devalue the medical profession. The bill actually undermines the professionalism of our medical profession, particularly psychologists and counsellors. It is essentially attempting to limit their scope of practice by law based on this parliament and the AG's medical expertise. While we acknowledge individuals who took part in the consultation process and shared their lived experiences of conversion practices in the past, basing the bill on events significantly in the past without significant demonstration of current practices that are, ca that are causing concern is foolish. What constitutes a conversion practice in itself is also open to interpretation as there have been no detailed studies in the most recent years explicitly providing the numbers, statistics, methods or forms of the conversion practices performed to base the bill on substance. The Shoes Fishers Farmers Party also notes there has been a conscious attempt by the Attorney General to protect dangerous practices on minors, such as puberty blockers and gender reassignment medical treatments, from being considered a conversion practice. It is a particular concern to many parents within the community of the emerging evidence from other jurisdictions of harm from gender affirming care, particularly to those that are under the age of 18. I would say to the Attorney General and this House that when it comes to conversion practices, the barn door must swing both ways. 
This is one of the most polarising issues that has come up in my experience. The Shooters Fishers Farmers Party has been inundated with emails and phone calls from a variety of constituents from not only conservative points of view uh, to, wider, to a other wide other range of spectrums of views, including the LGBTIQ plus community. This proves that that community itself is not in an agreement on this very topic and the approach being uh, applied. All plethora of organisations that reached out to us with very different political views have expressed a deep concern regarding this bill, coming in unison of agreement that this bill is a very problematic piece of legislation, regardless of one's belief, faith, background or lifestyle. Also, it is raised with us the very problematic reality of the consultation process, or rather lack of it, with the premeditated exclusion of certain groups that wish to express their views and be part of the bill writing process. We've been told that almost 150 organisations have been consulted, and even though this number may suggest a high volume of stakeholders consulted, the result is not reflected in reality. The Attorney General acknowledges and states that the LGBTQI plus people do not need fixing. However, the proposed legislation creates discussions around the need for legislation to ban conversion practices, which suggests there is a problem that needs to be addressed, but yet no current events are put forward to demonstrate the evidence of that problem. The opportunity to understand this more has been taken away by not letting this bill go through the committee process, as was the intention of the Selection of Bills Committee. This bill can't be considered as balanced legislation, as it's not entirely clear how this balance is achieved, especially considering the potential conflict between banning presumed perversion practices and protecting freedom of religious belief and faith-based practices and respecting civil liberties, all based on poor consultation and unclear use of definitions. Further to the balance issue, there might be a range of views presented on this topic with polarised viewpoints on the scope and nature of this legislation, clearly indicating that many stakeholders have concerns and objections to this bill. However, it's not explicitly stated how these different views were addressed or reconciled in the drafting of the bill, as the final draft demonstrates only one side of the story. While the bill provides exclusions for certain practices, such as those conducted by registered health practitioners or attempting to limit faith-based some methods or practices, the criteria for determining what constitutes a conversion practice are broad and may lead to ambiguity. For instance, the definition of conversion practice includes actions aimed at changing or suppressing sexual orientation, but it is not entirely clear how the legis legislation distinguishes between harmful, harmful conversion practices and legitimate forms of therapy or expression if a person wishes or would need to access it with their full consent. The bill includes a delayed commencement period of 12 months after the assent, with the Attorney General is citing the need for implementation, training and education of the relevant agencies and community groups as reflected from the consultation. However, it's not explicitly stated how this delay will address concerns or facilitate smoother implementation raising questions about the necessity and effectiveness of the delay or who and what effect it would have on the stakeholders who are very concerned about what effect this bill will hold. Possibly the awareness campaign would not be necessary for different agencies and community groups if the bill was addressing a current problem that everyone was aware of. We don't know what the implementation will actually look like or what content would constitute the material distributed. Just like the consultation process, it raises more questions than answers. Instead of enacting unnecessary and unbalanced legislation, we should be focused on fostering understanding, empathy, compassion and acceptance for all individuals and their circumstances, regardless of their sexual orientation, uh, and actually trying to come up with a fairer solution that is actually clearly well, uh, clearly well defined. Another part relates to the mental element of the offence, but does not actually turn on harm but rather on the intention of the offender to change or suppress another person's sexual orientation or, as is listed in the bill, gender identity, with suppress once again being undefined. However, the legislation also requires evidence of physical or mental harm that either endangers life or is substantial for the offence to be proven. This creates a contradiction as the mental element focuses on intention rather than harm, while the requirement for harm suggests a focus on the consequences. 
There is a certain subjectivity of harm. The speech mentions that harm must either endanger the victim's life or be substantial to, sat to satisfy the offence, with substantial harm defined as more than trivial or inconsequential. However, what constitutes substantial harm is subjective and open to interpretation, which could lead to inconsistencies in enforcing the law. This is a term that has no mention in the Interpretation Act of 1987. According to the Bill and the second reading speech, individuals under 18 cannot commit criminal offences of delivering a conversion practice, but they can be victims of such practice, practices. This is a confused line of thinking when you consider dollying to PACs. Here in this occasion, I'd also like to mention the importance of per parents' rights and choices. As parents are responsible for raising a child and their wellbeing and development and respecting their rights in deciding what is best for their children, and this should be paramount and represented in the bill. Consent and faith-based practices become another conflicting aspect of the bill. While the speech clarifies that consent is not relevant to proving the criminal offence, it also emphasises that the legislation does not cover the expression of religious belief if not directed to change or suppress sexual orientation. However, determining whether religious practices are intended to change or suppress identity can be complex and subjective, leading to potential conflicts between religious freedom and the law's objectives, while undermining all the work that has actually been done in past parliaments on consent and informed consent as it relates to interpersonal relationships. Further, another problematic aspect of the bill is the extraterritorial application. The legislation provides for partial extraterritorial application outside of New South Wales, meaning that as long as part of the diversion practice occurs within New South Wales, the whole practice can be considered a criminal offence. This raises practical challenges regarding jurisdiction and enforcement, especially if conversion practices conducted online, remotely or in international settings. When any possible remotely online delivered activities considered, conversion practices have to be addressed and any alleged offender prosecuted. This would be extremely difficult. The maximum penalty for the principal criminal offence is five years imprisonment, aligning with such offences as stalking and assault. However, some stakeholders may argue that the severity of penalties is not proportional to the harm caused by conversion practices, especially considering the potential psychological and long-term effects on victims. But since there has been no open widespread consultation and general awareness of this bill, that is an unresolved matter. Shoes Fishers Farmers Party has listened to many different groups on this issue, including many within the LGBTQI plus community, and it is clear that this bill does not have widespread support, even amongst people within that community. I cite we have amendments to the bill that I will discuss later in the in-committee stage, uh, including the fact around the uh, medical transition uh, procedures because this bill allows for the exclusion for medical transition to whatever gender identity a person wishes to change to. Um, and as I uh, said in the past, uh, or just recently uh, in the speech, I believe this is a barn door that should swing both ways. Um, it should not matter what sexual orientation a person changes to or from if we are considering dangerous conversion practices we should consider all possibilities of practices that may be dangerous and examine the evidence. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the Shooters, Fishers, Farmers Party is urging members to object to this bill that's been poorly drafted, often confused, and has vague definitions, and actually stand up for principles of freedom, freedom of religious and faith-based practices, and individual rights. We'd ensure, we should ensure that everyone has a right to live authentically and without fear of persecution or discrimination, but unfortunately, this bill does not achieve that. The Honourable Susan Carter. Mr Deputy President, we live in a society founded on mutual respect, and even if it does go without saying, it is important that it is said from time to time that all people, heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, transsexual, asexual, or wherever else one sits on the LGBTIQA plus rainbow, are respected and have the right to live their lives in freedom and not be forced to change who they are. 
Though this House has recognised this fact previously, it is important that we continue to work to ensure that all people of our state are accepted and respected. This bill is important, and that means it is important that we get it right. The issue with this bill, as it is with so much of what we do in this House, is the balance between competing interests. By living in society together, we accept limits on our unfettered rights, and we recognise that getting a balance point can be difficult. And so it is very disappointing that the consultation process which informed the development of this bill was so private, was by invitation only, and further that Labor used their numbers in the Legislative Council to block a committee inquiry into this bill. This is a standard process in this House. It was regarded as useful for the jury bill, and it would have been even more useful for a bill like this, which raises issues of such significant community interest, one we want to consider carefully and get right. In the consultation, I understand that there were only two women's groups included, but we don't know definitely because the stakeholder list is secret. And while the faith leaders may have been consulted, from the telephone in my office and from the email inbox, it is very clear that the faithful do not feel that their voice has been heard and they have significant concerns about this bill and whether the balance of protections and freedoms has landed in the right place. We first saw this bill a week ago. Our one and only briefing was less than a week ago. I am speaking at after midnight in a debate which is unlikely to end before breakfast because Labor chose to organise their legislative program in this way. Labor are rushing through legislation when we should be working carefully to get the balance right. It's almost as if Labor doesn't really care about this important issue, but this is a KPI they want to tick off and move on. This exclusion of the voices of the community is surprising in another way. This legislation, if I understand its intent correctly, is to make a powerful statement about inclusion and respect. This needs to be done with the community, not at the community. Uh, and there are many people who have questions about this legislation and how it will interact with freedom of religion. This bill clearly identifies religious practices as conversion practices and then provides a rather circular exception for those religious practices which are not also conversion practices. What we see in this bill is that collision of different worldviews, which will continue to happen in a pluralist society such as ours, and which we need to approach respectfully. I think in this bill we also see a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of religion. Religion is always a call to conversion. But this is an internal call. The conversion is our personal response. We are not converted by the prayer or the preaching of others, which may serve as an invitation to convert. We are converted by our own free, willed and chosen response. Of course, we do not want people hurt by religion. We no longer live in the days of Torquemada and we need to find a respectful balance. But this balance is only found by truly seeking to understand and respect the role of religious faith and the way in which conversion of all kinds may be part of faith. And I'm concerned that this bill does not do this. The role of religion is to challenge us, to ask us to examine our lives, to ask us how we want to live. And we want to make sure that this role is still protected under this law. It is part of the solemn duty of this parliament always to be balancing worldviews and to ensure that people are able to pursue the good in their lives and to follow what they deem most important. For many people of our state, that includes the ability to pursue their religion, a firm belief in a metaphysical reality which forms an inherent part of their lives, one which we can never and should never try to suppress, to convert or to extract from their day-to-day -day lives. Religion, therefore, is a personal call to internal conversion. And here we come to another issue which I find perplexing about this legislation. It excludes the possibility that adults can freely consent. 
it is truly remarkable that adults are not respected by this legislation to be able to ask freely for support which they believe will be of assistance to them if that support could be construed as a conversion practice. Another major concern raised with me in relation to this bill is the inclusion of gender identity as well as sexual orientation. In many ways, this is a clumsy inclusion as gender transition needed to be included as an express exemption to conversion practices. And the fear being expressed is that the way in which this has been done leads to only one lawful response to an adolescent querying their gender identity, that the new gender identity must be affirmed. This is problematic in many respects. The LGBAA, another group excluded from consultation by the Labor government, have made powerful submissions about the way in which gender transitioning, before a person really knows their true self, may actually be a way of what they call transing the gay away. They are concerned that too often what is described as gender-affirming care actually seeks to medically and surgically fix homosexual and autistic people who are distressed about their gender and or their sexuality. This runs directly counter to the other strong message in this legislation, that one's sexual orientation is not something which needs to be fixed. Internally incoherent legislation is never good legislation. The LGBAA continue that therapists, parents, families, educators, support workers and researchers could all be inadvertently captured by the proposed legislation, ultimately harming LGB people who need their support. And they continue that this legislation will not only create a chilling effect on legitimate research, education, debate and therapy, but will suppress and effect effectively remove from the public sphere all gender critical views. The LGBAA consider the international experience and claim that this legislation simply ignores the overwhelming evidence from the US, the UK, Finland, France, Denmark, the Netherlands, Sweden and Italy, that gender affirming care does not improve mental health or gender distress, but may in fact cause irreversible harm, including sterility. This is of significant concern, but their voice was ignored in the consultation for this bill. They are concerned that in acting a law that bans conversion practices for both sexual orientation and gender identity will harm the very group that this legislation is supposed to protect by implementing what they refer to as, and I quote, modern conversion therapy for gays, end quote. And to support their claim, they note that same-sex attracted young women are significantly overrepresented in gender clinics with rates ranging from 80 to 90%. And they caution that by including gender identity, the proposed legislation will wrongly affirm homosexual people as the opposite gender and will impact young people who might otherwise mature into healthy, happy adults, many of whom will be lesbian or gay. And this is because they caution that embedding gender identity into law will reinforce the harmful stereotype that homosexuals are somehow born in the wrong body, suggesting medical and surgical changes as solutions for homosexuality. The successful evidence-based strategy for reducing gender distress, talking therapy or watchful waiting, will be, they are concerned, classified as conversion therapy under the proposed legislation. Research indicates that under the watchful waiting model, 80 to 90% of young people resolve their discomfort with their bodies, essentially experiencing puberty and maturing into the adult that they were always going to be, often lesbian or gay. The bill's inclusion of gender identity, they caution, deliberately limits the ability of mental health practitioners to offer alternative models of care to patients experiencing gender distress. These are important arguments about the effectiveness of this legislation from an authoritative community voice, which must be heard if this legislation is to truly affirm that not one person in our state is born broken and not one person in our state is inherently flawed. It is important that we see the whole person and if the spirit of this bill is to assert that LGBTIQA plus 
persons are not born broken or wrong or flawed, then we should look seriously at whether the gender identity provisions belong in this bill alongside sexual orientation. These are real concerns which must be addressed before this bill can proceed. Um, a serious concern that the bill will mandate an affirmative care model for gender identity and that young adult members of families will not be able to discuss freely with health practitioners and parents issues of gender identity and instead will only be offered an affirmation model. Nobody's born broken, but growing up can be very hard. And so often many of us feel broken and at many other times of our lives as well. And when we feel like that, we often feel that life would be just so easy if there was just some external change that could be made. Our young people must be supported and helped through these feelings. But this legislation could create barricades against professionals and parents and others who love that young person from being able to do that. It should be amended so that it does not. Families have also raised concerns with me more broadly about the continuing ability to provide moral guidance for their children, to set family rules, and to have the robust and challenging discussions which are always a feature of successful family life. They've also raised the issue that the view of family expressed in this legislation is unduly narrow and not consistent with the reality of modern family life, especially for our called communities. Families today are much more than parents and children, and this legislation should recognise the reality of family life. The simple question I keep being asked is, can parents still say no? Or is this now a suppression practice? We need parents to be able to set limits and enforce guidelines for their children, and to do this without the forced involvement of anti-discrimination anti New South Wales. The criminal offence carries a requirement of substantial harm before an offence is committed. However, the civil redress scheme allows action to be taken for conversion practices without any proof of harm. Say a 15-year-old comes home and says they are transitioning. Their parents say, wait and see, let's see if you still feel the same way at 18. The 15-year-old complains about his parents at school and if this, as many fear, is regarded as a suppression practice under the Act, then a complaint can be made on behalf of that child to anti-discrimination New South Wales. The parents then find themselves in a conciliation conference with their own child and an enforceable agreement being made between parents and children about sexuality and gender identity. Do we really believe that the law should be this active inside family life when there has been no threshold of harm that has to be satisfied. This is characterised as a civil redress scheme. Do we really believe that this is the right use of the law for children to be using the law to seek redress against their own parents? When speaking on this matter in the other place, the Attorney General said, and I quote, the Anti-Discrimination Board has the power to conduct investigations and inquiries relating to conversion practices. Action taken by the Board following an investigation may include education and engagement with relevant individuals and bodies. Conversion practice legislation in Victoria carries a similar provision and the Victorian Human Rights Commission also has the power to order an individual to undertake a targeted education program at their own cost to educate them on the harms of conversion practices. These programs are provided by the Victorian Human Rights Commission and cost between $2,000 and $4,500 depending on the program which has been mandated. Again, we turn to the question of balance. Is the right balance point between protection and freedom found in this legislation? And to answer that, we have to ask, what is the proper limit of the law? And I strongly submit that it is outside the parent-child relationship. It is not including mandated education for parents um, in relation to their own children, and it should not limit parents setting their guidelines for children. I hope that this bill is appropriately amended before it passes Parliament. There are too many concerns held by too many people for it simply to be rubber stamped by this chamber. Of course, passing this legislation is only one part of the process of the operation of this law. 
It will inevitably need to be interpreted by judges, tribunal members, anti-discrimination New South Wales, police and community members. And to do this, the principles of statutory interpretation, so well articulated by Chief Justice French and other members of the High Court of Australia will be engaged, which require us to consider text, context and purpose. The second reading speech of the Attorney General and contributions by other ministers such as the Health Minister provide some extrinsic context, but of course are per perhaps more correctly characterised as statements of the will of the Executive rather than the will of Parliament itself. We know that Parliament's purpose is metaphorical and collective, and we know that it is often best found in the text of the legislation. But we also know that the purpose of Parliament is found by considering what was before Parliament at the time of enactment and what was Parliament's understanding of the meaning and effect of the words of the legislative text. So to assist those who will need to interpret this legislation, I want to read into Hansard extracts from a document which represents the understanding, the mind and the purpose of Parliament when enacting this legislation. It is the standard letter being sent by members of the government to those raising questions about this legislation. It forms the basis of briefings to all stakeholders and members of the crossbench and as such represents the collective and metaphorical purpose of parliament at the time of enactment of this legislation. And I quote, here is what the bill does. It protects the expression of a religious belief. And I note that this is done without limitation. So this expression in a church, in a synagogue, in a mosque, in a temple, in a school, in a preschool, in any other setting of religious beliefs, it is the intention of parliament that it is protected in this bill. I return to the document. It protects religious teachings. It protects the expression that religious beliefs ought to be followed. It protects the right to prayer. And I note again that this is expressed without limitation and so it is to be understood as to operate in this bill without limitation as the collective expression of the will of parliament. I return to the document. It protects discussions between parents and their children about sexuality and gender. And I note that of course these discussions, as all discussions are understood within families, will be robust, sometimes challenging, but always loving and always looking to the long-term interests of that child. I return to the document. It protects the rules of religious orders, for example, the celibacy of priests. It protects general school rules, such as uniform requirements. And I note that this is, of course, in addition to, and not in replacement of, the broad rights around expression of religious belief and prayer, which were outlined above, and so is protective of the rights of religious schools to present a consistent and coherent message to their pupils. And I return to the document, and to be clear, this is what the bill does not do. It does not stop you from telling a young person not to have sex before marriage. It does not stop you counselling a married person not to have an affair. And I observe that clearly by implication, it does not stop the setting of guidelines and boundaries around the expression of sexual orientation. So this is what Parliament intends this legislation to mean. This legislation has excellent intentions, but needs to address serious questions before stakeholders will be confident that it will operate beneficially. Ms Kate Fairman. Thank you, Mr Assistant President. Uh, I rise to support this bill. The Conversion Practices Ban Bill 2024, and I acknowledge the contribution of my Greens colleagues in this and the other place, and Dr Amanda Conn, uh, who is leading for us um, on uh, this bill. This has been a very long time coming, Mr Assistant President. It has been a long time coming for the many survivors, advocates and organisations that have worked tirelessly to end the practice of conversion, of trying to change or suppress a person's sexuality or gender identity. This reform has been a very long time coming for a lot of people. But it's important to recognise that from the outset, it's also come too late for so many people. It's come too late for so many people who came before us and never got to live a life where they were free to be their true selves, where they could live their lives openly and with joy and with pride, where they could love who they wanted to love. It's come too late for those people who took their own lives 
because they were told that they were unworthy, because they were sinners, because their identity was a disorder, because they were sick, because of who, because who they were was denied, because they were erased. But it is here now, and it's a very, very good thing. The Greens have consistently opposed conversion practices and ideologies, and we have advocated for a complete ban on so-called reparative, sexual orientation and gender identity conversion practices. Former Australian Greens leader Bob Brown, the first openly gay member of the Australian Parliament, has openly spoken about how, as a young medical student in Canberra, he struggled with his homosexuality, even consenting to conversion therapy. Yes, he uh, is Christian. This consisted of him receiving electric shocks while being shown photos of naked men, and I'll acknowledge the uh, very uh, uh, warming, heartwarming and excellent contribution by uh, the Honourable Stephen Lawrence. And this sounds almost exactly the same, uh, how uh, Bob Brown has spoken about what happened to him. So receiving electric shocks while being shown photos of naked men, not just one session, multiple sessions. This practice was intended to shock him straight on the contrary, it almost drove Bob Brown to suicide. This is a long time ago uh, in the 60s. Yet even today, uh, in New South Wales, of course, the practice continues, albeit to a lesser extent, as religious organisations and practitioners have been exposed and challenged over the years. And others have actually simply woken up to how damaging these conversion practices were and are. But after much pressure by advocates, and at this stage uh, I will acknowledge the very hard work uh, of those uh, who are here today, who some in the public gallery, but uh, most of them uh, I understand are, 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 they're here. Uh, and hopefully they'll be here when this bill passes, but I will acknowledge uh, uh, the work of Alex Greenwich, who uh, I have worked with 13 years ago or something in this place on uh, marriage equality, uh, the marriage equality campaign. Anna Brown uh, also worked on that campaign with Anna, but of course for everybody uh, who is here today to see this through and has worked so hard. And I am so thrilled that this bill uh, is before us today. Um, and I will acknowledge the fact that Alex Greenwich did bring uh, that bill before the other place and the political pressure, of course, uh, that has led to the government introducing um, their bill and for us to be here uh, debating this one. Um, conversion therapy is pseudoscience based on archaic, bigoted ideology that people from LGBTQIA plus communities are broken, disordered, unworthy. It has lasting negative impacts on people's lives and especially so for people of faith. In 2018, a report by La Trobe University, the Human Rights Law Centre and Gay and Lesbian Health Victoria uh, told the lived experiences of 15 LGBTQIA plus people and their struggle to reconcile their sexuality and transgender identities with the beliefs and practices of their religious community. The report provided a comprehensive history of the conversion movement in Australia, together with legal analysis and recommendations for reform. Since the release of that report, Victoria, the ACT and New Zealand have all outlawed conversion practices. However, just as for so many other issues concerning sex, sexuality, gender, religion and women's rights, New South Wales is playing catch up. But here we are, and as I said, it's a very good thing. The objects of this bill before us today are encouraging to prohibit change or suppression practices and to establish a civil response scheme and to ensure that all people, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression, feel welcome and valued in New South Wales and are able to live authentically and with pride. However, the government has weakened these objects by exemptions contained in the bill which have the effect of ensuring that people, particularly young people, who are part of certain religious organisations, often through no choice of their own, are still able to be subject to homophobic and transphobic sermons and preachings. 
These sermons and preachings can still have terrible impacts on the mental health and self-worth of people subjected to them, particularly young people coming to terms with their sexuality or experiencing gender dysphoria. And I will note the contribution of the Honourable Susan Carter before me, who uh, talked about religion as a choice, who talked about that conversion to religion as a choice. It is not a choice for the 12-year-old or the 13-year-old or the 14-year-old, Mr assistant president who has to go to that church because their family drags them there every weekend, sometimes every night, depending on the faith. It's not a choice. And this is what this bill here today is uh, protecting those young people from. However, a significant weakness is that it doesn't protect them from the sermons and the preachings of religious leaders who still say that being sexually attracted to someone of the same sex is sinful. It doesn't protect them from that. And that is a travesty that we still have. We are, it is good, again, that this bill is before us today, but it is a significant weakness. Um, because the government was very quick to allay concerns from some religious organisations, uh, in particular to assure them that religious freedom will not be impacted by this bill. Um, they've gone to great lengths to ensure that expressing a belief through sermon, taking offence at religious teachings and seeking guidance through pairs, prayers are not included in the bill's provisions. Um, to us, it's a bit unclear as to just how far these exemptions go. We don't support exemptions for religious teaching sermons or prayers. And I uh, know that my colleague, uh, Dr Amanda Conn, will be moving uh, amendments to uh, hopefully address this. Unfortunately, uh, we know where things are going tonight. Uh, but we, uh, of course, will do what we can to get that over the line. Um, because it's been the religious organisations and private rehabilitation facilities, but largely, of course, religious organisations and uh, beliefs that have told LGBTQI plus people that they should pray the gay away. It's been faith-based practitioners who have subjected residents to exorcism and medically abusive interventions like chemical castration. The Greens believe that these exemptions are just a completely unacceptable loophole in the protections that the bill offers, offers and they should be a significant cause for concern. And I'll note at this point, the politics around don't move amendments, we've just got to get the bill through, accept the bill as it is, and it's extremely disappointing that the community is told that, the community understands that... Uh, the power of those sermons. They understand uh, that if those sermons and preachings can still continue, then people will still be experiencing harm. They will still be experiencing uh,